0.7, which is below 0.8 before this rule. But the R value, which is the predictive value of this algorithm, is 0.42. If we strip out those features, we could go to an adverse effect ratio of 0.94, which is great. It's above the 0.8. Um, but we didn't lose that much in the predictive value of 0.4. Does that make sense? So you can start to play with which features are helpful, which features are not helpful. And you need to look at the features and go, like if the, if the feature was facial luminance, like how much does light reflect off the face, you're like, yeah, I can conceptually understand why that might contribute to bias against a certain class. Does that make sense? So these are things you can play with around mitigating bias. Um, so we also have worked on something called attractiveness bias, which seems like, why would you look at attractiveness in the HR context? It's not a protected class. Um, being ugly is not going to help you get a job. Um, <laughs> but there are actually countries that want, want to score attractiveness. They want to say, we only want people that look like X. Um, we don't do that, by the way. Uh, we will not help with that. With that. Um, but what, what we were interested in is, one, does attractiveness contribute to whether somebody gets a job or not? And then, does an algorithm propagate that bias? Does that make sense? So we took a data, so we built an attractiveness model. Actually, our friend Ben Taylor at Ziff, I'll give him credit, built the model. We worked on it with him, and I worked on it with him, and he built it, and we said, could we use it? Um, but the, the algorithm basically take, takes pictures from the internet and ratings of people off the internet from sites that you can uh, look at. Um, and it will build a predictive model of how people would rate an image or a person based on that image. Um, you can see. Ray Fiennes is apparently the most attractive man that ever lived. Um, and people, and being, poli being a politician does not require uh, much on the attractive side. Um, and yeah, so we built a model that can predict that. You can kind of predict anything from an image if you, if you, if you work at it. Um, and I think there's one interesting lesson in this. So, so Ben Taylor used to work for me, for, for, for with us at Higher View. He was our chief data scientist. And, like, Hire has always had this idea of like, oh, we could just build that. Um, and there are a lot of things in the AI space that you can just build a model for. There's a lot of algorithms out there. Uh, the algorithms are not the hard part. The data set is the hard part. And there's a lot of free data out there that you can scrape. Um, this was scraped from an API. Just wrote a script, scraped the data, put in the model, built the model. And Ben is amazing at saying, oh, we can just build that. But he follows the word tonight. We can just build that tonight. And the next day, he's like, I built an attractive model last night. Um, there's, if you're thinking about these kinds of problems, there is probably a data set out there that you can use. Um, and then I'm also going to say, like, getting the data is really, really hard. Getting good performance data is incredibly hard. Um, and I'll talk more about that in a minute. But going back to attractiveness, we built this model that could look at attractiveness. And then we looked at, because we have rating data from people, uh, we have who got hired data from people. We wanted to find out, like, do pe people who are rated highest are they also the most attractive on this rating scale? Does that make sense? What do you think happened? Did yeah. more attractive people get hired more readily? I see a nod. Yes, that's true. Um, so this was a retail brand that we did this particular study on. Um, if you were rated a 7, it was a 0 to 10 scale that we actually used for the study. You were twice as likely to get hired if you were rated a 7 than a 3. Like, that seems horrible. Like, the Hiring process today is so biased in so many ways. Like I would never have believed it until I kind of got into it. But we come up with these biases, we come up with shorthand rules, we interview people we don't know what to ask, we don't know what success actually looks like, we don't know what answer that they could give that would actually predict success, and we're usually thinking of something else when we're interviewing today. Um, like that's not a good process. Like this process should be approved by, by machines. Um, and again, somebody walks in and they're going to be evaluated on how much the interviewer, how attractive the interviewer thinks they are. And it just seems wrong. So, ah, I left out the slide. But what it turns out, so then we build a predictive model that says let's look at performance data and let's look at the interviews these people took and let's see if we, the algorithm that predicts performance also prefers people that are attractive. So what do we think happened? Well, it turns out the algorithm doesn't care at all. It's not looking for that is only noticing for the things, the features that are going in that actually predict performance. So it's, this is a really kind of exciting result when people think, oh, we just propagate bias with these algorithms. It's like, no, 
if we train the algorithm the thing that actually matters, we can eliminate some of the human biases that are, that are sort of plaguing the, the hiring process. So I think that's super cool. Um, so a couple of just best practices around AI for hiring, um, like that apply to a lot of other things. Um, you really want to understand and control um, what features go into the model. So don't use facial movements. Like it just isn't a good idea. Um, so think about the features going in. Um, don't use attractiveness, for example. That's probably not a good idea either. If you had an attractiveness feature. Um, so strive to use features that are not tightly tied to class, like I just said, facial luminance. Um, you know, strive to make sure your algorithm is, in, is blind to these classes. Um, and then the other piece is, once you launch a model, even if you tested it, it may not actually behave the way you think it did in testing. And so it's really helpful to sort of continually monitor. And so because we can look at every video that comes in and make a prediction about age, gender, ethnicity, we can then also see, are our is our scoring behaving the way that we expected it to? And all kinds of things can happen in the hiring process after the fact. Like, they can start sourcing from different schools, different places, they can hire a new head of recruiting, into different instructions to the recruiters about what resumes to flow through. Um, they can stop interviewing everybody and only interview like a certain group of people. Um, and that would change the way the algorithm works. So the, the algorithms aren't like static. They don't just sit there and they behave the same way. They're influenced by all kinds of things. They're influencing inputs. Um, okay, so lesson two is getting data is hard. Um, and it's easy. So like I said earlier, like Ben Taylor, uh, who runs SIF, is uh, amazing. And just be like, oh yeah, I went out and pulled this data set from here, and I built this model last night, and look, it's amazing. Um, that's, that's surprisingly easy to do sometimes. Um, but sometimes it's really, really hard to get good data. I'll give two examples. One is performance data. Um, how do I get, for us, we need about three to 400 examples of interviews that are with a, with a performance target. In other words, I need to know 400 interviews, and I need to know that these 200 were good and these 200 were bad. Well, okay, that's actually hard to get. Going to a company and saying, can you give me 400 interviews? And I'm like, well, I only did 300 last year. Oh, I don't know how to build a model for you. That's really tough. Um, or they say, well, we only hire 5% of the people, so if we're gonna use the hiring decision, now I have a very imbalanced data set. I don't have like half are good, half are bad. I have 40 were good and 360 were bad. Well, that's not a good way to build a model. You really wanna have some balance in your label set, um, so you have to think about that. Um, just having a set, oh, I've got 400 examples. It's not balanced in the right way. Um, and then you have to sort of consider like, is the performance data any good, right? If, if it's just like, if it's like, did the manager like the person, or did they like going to lunch with the person, that can be super random, and you'll never find, you can't predict something, there's no pattern to it, right? Or well, we're just predicting somebody likes, which isn't actually a good thing to do. So these are all the kinds of things we have to think about. Um, another example of a really hard data set is we made a dubious decision to build our own speech-to-text model. So we've got all these interviews, I've got this audio, we have to pay 60 cents to $1.50 to get that transcribed into text so that we can run language models on it. We thought, oh, it'd be a great idea to build our own speech text model. Well, that's a terrible idea. Uh, it's like the worst idea. Because where do you get tens of thousands of hours of audio with an accurate transcript that's lined up in the right time sequence so that you can build a predictive model? That's an incredibly hard data set to get. You go, oh, let's just use movie, let's just use, uh, we'll get a bunch of DVDs, we'll rip those, and we'll use the, the subtitles. 